Last week on Transition Season Training. That also got me is when looking at this text in verse 13, the word rejoice in Greek is an imperative, which means it's not a suggestion or an option. It's a command. So that means he's commanding us to rejoice. God is. So that means if I'm not rejoicing in the Lord in suffering, I'm sinning in suffering. You suffer well by not sinning in suffering. If I'm not rejoicing in the Lord in suffering, I'm sinning in suffering. Because it's not an option. He's this is this is a command from the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Rejoice in the Lord. I thought that was so good. Cause I'm like, well, what are how do we share in the sufferings of Christ? You participate, you become a partner with the suffering. And so a lot of times, uh I think, you know, um, the world teaches us, our Western culture teaches us to flee sorrow, but Christianity teaches us not to flee sorrow, but to actually partner with the pain. And so it's like, how, how do we do that? How do we become partners with suffering? Partnering with suffering is not running from it. It's not trying to flee it. It's not trying to, trying to escape it. It's not trying to just, just give me this Tylenol and make it go away. Yeah. No, it's like sit in the pain, but also know that I'm sitting in it with you. Yeah. yeah I think about the scripture that said, you know, he's, his goal is to know Christ and his and him crucified and him yeah. crucified Christ and him, his suffering. And you think like, well, why would you it was like, no, because cru- the crucifixion is, it, it, we cannot remove the crucifixion you from Christ. You can't take the pain away from Jesus. You can't take the pain away from Jesus. Like, we want Jesus to take the pain away from us. You know, then it's like, after that, the power of his resurrection. But we can't take the, re- we can't separate crucifixion and resurrection. Right. Holy Spirit gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. That got me. Because anytime we hear that phrase, Jesus is always sitting Mm. at the right hand of the Father. He's always sitting. Mm. But this time, at the point of Stephen's suffering, in the midst of Stephen's suffering, the the moment he's getting ready to die, Mm -hmm. we see by the Spirit of God, he's able to see heaven. Mm -hmm. And he sees Jesus not seating at the right hand of the Father making intercession. He sees Jesus standing. Now, what do you? who do you have to be and what do you got to do for Jesus to give you a standing ovation? I feel loved and all of this stuff. And in my mind, I thought that that was going to be over. With. Yeah. I, in <laughs> my mind, I thought like, oh, wow. Okay, save. Like, save from everything else. But then I, I would, like, my soul was shocked. Right. <laughs> my, my, like I was like, whoa! Like I thought that that was the end of that, right. but that was one of the most excruciating places of pain that I ever experienced in my life. And I would always say, like, man, God, you threw me out in this ocean, and I don't know how to swim. Like I don't know how to swim. But hindsight, looking back on that, is that I didn't know how to swim, but He also didn't let me drown. That's good. Yeah. Same, same. We went through that together, but mm. <clears throat> that's, it's something about suffering that is lonely. Mm. Like it's very lonely. And so it helps us glorify God. It helps us see what's more important. And we have to understand that glorifying, making sure God is glorified, got to be most important. And this is what I wrote down. Trials will do more damage to people who have perverse priorities. Yeah. Every, every, I, I've been a pastor for 15 years, Mm -hmm. unapologetically. I've been pastoring y'all for 15 years. Some of y'all shorter than that, but nobody longer than 15 years because I've only been a pastor for 15 years. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) You thought that was funny. I thought it was funny. Yeah, I laugh at the the corny stuff. stuff. But I've seen over my 15 years of pastoring, trials do more damage to people whose priorities are perverse. I, if if the glory of God is not your main number one priority and glory of self or advancement of career is is your number one priority, that trial's going to tear you up in ways it, it really shouldn't have. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like you still yeah. going like uh, <clears throat> the scripture talks about um, the scripture talks about escaping the fire escaping a trial or escaping a situation or the judgment of God as somebody just barely escaping naked by the skin of their teeth, Mm. teeth. Like it's either, either you can, you can come out of it 
this great way or you can come out of it just barely. You can come out, but you just barely make it like somebody escaping a house on fire. Like, and so that's kind of how I see mm. Um, how I've seen over the over my 15 years, like I've seen people, I've seen people come out with like this pristine new perspective and outlook on life and God and 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 love and sex and money and just all kind of stuff, like just this whole new person <laughs> because of trial. But on mm-hmm. the flip side, I've also seen like, yeah, I think about the scripture we we reference. Um, um, it, the house that's built on the, the two different foundations, yeah, yeah. right? And so you have this house and pain and suffering and trials come um, that still stand because they they have a firm, solid foundation that's built on rock, the rock, which is Jesus. Mm-hmm. But then, like you said, when if you have a perverse perspective, it's that the house that's built on a shaky foundation, like it's it's bound to fall. Yeah. It's bound to fall, mm-hmm. and so it's because we're holding. On to things that cannot hold us up. Like we are holding on to things that are not strong enough to hold us up. And I think that that is where, like you said, whether it's the promotion or uh, the family or, you know, the husband or the wife or whatever it may be. Because, yep. you know, having this perspective, this is the reason why I'm living my life. Well, if that is your reason, when these things happen, it's going to knock you down completely. Because you were you were standing on or building on rather the wrong foundation, having a perverse perspective that this is what life is meant to be about. Yeah, First Corinthians. I was talking about First Corinthians three eleven. For no one can lay a foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw. Their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. Judgment day. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If Mm -hmm. what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. And so I just I just thought that was that was great because I think trial and judgment and suffering and fiery trial, you know, what I mean, and. I think it has this this way of if <clears throat> if our priorities aren't right, if our if our priorities aren't where they need to be, the trials will do more damage than what they should have. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like like imagine Job. If Job hadn't responded to the trial the way he responded, what would have happened to him? Yeah, and t- Job had he had so and it wasn't that he didn't question God. I mean, because he did. Yeah. He did. He did question. But he also, he also knew something. He number one, he knew no, number one, he knew that. Listen, I I, I didn't do nothing to deserve this. Right. That he knew that, like he his friends tried to accuse him of wrongdoing. I, Job was like, nope, that that ain't it. I don't know exactly why this is happening, but I know that that's not it. And so even him having a clear conscience mm-hmm. about him, his pursuit of righteousness toward God, and so he inevitably he was like there, there has to be something more i don't know what this is but there has to be something more to it than that because i know for certain that i've been you know pursuing god and even his perspective even with you know he's asking all these questions and god is like well where were you when when i did this when i did this, when I did this. <laughs> you know, it's like god yeah. was like let me run it back for you and Job was like yeah you're right like you know even when his wife said you might as well just go ahead and curse God and died. And he was like, no, I'm not going to do that. Like, he still had a love. His wife. Yeah. And doggone wives. But go ahead. No. She just had a lapse in judgment at that time. She was going through. She was in pain. She was in pain, too. We forget that. Yeah, she was in pain. We, she was in pain, she was too. In pain. She lost the same kids Job lost. She lost, lost the, the same, same house stuff, The same Job land. Did. The same. She had a witness and watch her husband suffer through that stuff, too. So she's suffering, too. She just had the an adverse reaction. Mm-hmm. What you just talked about? Yeah, she had a she had a different reaction than Job mm-hmm. did. We can't, but we she got the bad she got a bad rap. Mm-hmm. But baby girl was processing differently than Job, mm-hmm. right? So thank God for Job. 
Yeah. And but we see that the reason he ha- could have come to that conclusion, even when, you know, like even at the beginning of the book of Job, he says, you know, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. But blessed be the name of the Lord. Like even for him to have that perspective, number one reason, because the Bible lets us know that he was an upright man. The Bible says that he would go before the Lord, like offering, mm-hmm. making offerings for his children and That's all good. of that. The reason that he was able to have that perspective is because Job was constantly in the presence of God, that he constantly put himself in the presence of God constantly for God to reveal stuff about Job in his heart. God to reveal, you know, when Job's perspectives was off. God to maybe check Job when he thought that all his lock, stock and barrel was in his stuff and his kids like Job was putting himself constantly in the presence of God so that he could have a correct perspective when the pain and suffering came. That's good. Let's move on because we can sit up here all all day. All right. Verse 15. Read verse 15. Okay. Wait. (laughs) Verse 15 in the ESV. First Peter four, verse 15. So we got expected suffering, expect suffering, rejoice Rejoice in in suffering. Uh Three. Now three. We're going to talk about examine your life in suffering. Examine your life in suffering. Verse 15. Here we go. It says, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief. If you're going to suffer, suffer for the right stuff. Don't suffer as a murderer. Or a thief. Or a thief. Or an evildoer. Or an evildoer. Or as a meddler. Or as a meddler. That word meddler there means somebody who don't mind their own business. Somebody who always in somebody else's business and got something to say about everybody else's stuff but their own. Oh. And he 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 attributes meddler to evildoer, thief, mm-hmm. and murderer. Mm-hmm. Because if you're a meddler, nine times out of ten, you're an evildoer, you're a thief. And you're a murderer. Oh, and not necessarily murdering physically, but you're murdering with your mouth. Mm-hmm. And so I think verse 15 lets us know that we are to examine our life and suffering. Keep going. I'm sorry. Okay. Verse 16. Fi- it's, yeah. You 16 now? Yeah. You read 15? Yes. Read it again. I'm sorry. Okay. No worries. So, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Keep going. Yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian. Christian, there's only three times we see the word Christian in the whole Bible. And mm-hmm. this is one of the three. Let him not be ashamed, mm. but let him glorify God in that name. Suffering helps me see what's there. Why am I suffering? Mm. It's okay to ask yourself this question all the time. Let me tell you, sometimes the suffering you go through don't have nothing to do with God. Like sometimes you suffering because you trifling mm. or you talk too much. Or you made wrong decisions. Or you made wrong choices and decisions. And so you got to ask questions like, why am I suffering? Is this me? Mm-hmm. Right? Keep mm-hmm. going. Mm-hmm. So yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. 17, for it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. Judgment begins at the house of God. And if it begins with us, if it starts with me, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey? the? What's going to be an out? What's going to be an outcome of those who aren't saved? If I'm if I'm if I'm going through this fiery trial, keep going. Mm -hmm. And if the righteous is scarcely saved, scarcely, that's a word you need to underline. What will become of the ungodly and the sinner? He's talking about in suffering. Scarcely means with great difficulty. So we're saved. Yes, we are. But we're not saved without great difficulty. Mm -hmm. So he's saying like our souls are saved. We belong to Jesus. And he says, if the righteous, if those who belong to Jesus are scarcely saved, not like some of us going to be saved and some of us not. Mm -hmm. He's saying the righteous will be saved, but it's going to come with great difficulty. Mm -hmm. He says, what what do you think about those who who are not righteous and are suffering? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Therefore, that's verse 19. Therefore, let this is verse 19. Yes. Yeah. Let those who so ver- suffer. So the third one is examine your life and suffering. Why am I suffering? Is this God? Is this me? Mm-hmm. Correct what you need to correct. Control what you need to control. What you can't control, let it go. Okay. Verse 19. Mm-hmm. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will. Now, if you're suffering according to the will of God, here's an instruction for you. And trust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. So the last one is, so the first one is expect suffering. Mm -hmm. Second is rejoice in suffering. Third is examine your life in suffering. 
The fourth is now commit yourself to God in suffering. Mm -hmm. Read verse 19 one more time and we're going to wind it wind it down. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will and trust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Commit yourself to God. Let this suffering be the place of recommitting. Let this suffering be a place of surrender. Let this suffering be a place of you giving yourself over to the Lord again. Right? I like that verse 19. Yeah. Let those who suffer according to God's will. And when I think about it, 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 I mean, the scripture is clear according to God's will that our suffering, like we talked about earlier, God allowing it, God not doing it, but God allowing it. And so the suffering, when we suffer as Christians, when we examine our life and we see like, nope, I'm not a wrongdoer, I'm not an evildoer. <laughs> I haven't been, you know, doing any of these things that the Bible is telling me I shouldn't be suffering for as a Christian. But this may be a part of God's will for me to suffer in this way. And a lot of times we pray, you know, our prayer is, God, um, you know, heal. It's just your will. God, you are a healer. God, you are a deliverer. But we also need to understand that it is also God's will for us to suffer. And again, I, I was having this conversation with somebody, and then we were talking about even, you know, believing God for healing and things like that, and how in Christianity, some of us have been taught if we don't we don't have enough faith. You know, that's the reason why God didn't come through for us or God didn't heal or God didn't deliver or God didn't do this because we didn't have enough faith. But then that 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 puts too much power on us and not enough power on God, number one. But it also doesn't allow for scriptures like first Peter four nineteen that says, actually, this may be God's will for me to suffer like this. And so when we talked about uh, on Sunday, uh uh, and we talk about that prayer of Jesus, that Hebrews five and seven, where Jesus said he prayed. The Bible says that Jesus prayed with tears and loud cries. And it says that he was heard. Right. He said, save me from death. But we also see that Jesus prayed in the garden. His other prayer was not my will, but your will be done. And so understanding that sometimes it is God's will to heal. Sometimes it is God's will to deliver. Sometimes it is God's will to do those things. But sometimes it's God's will for me to suffer. According to the scriptures, sometimes it is God's will for me to suffer. And so it's not necessarily because I didn't believe God like I should have. No. And so when we pray, people, part of prayer, part of trusting God, part of putting your faith in God, it's not just putting my faith in God for him to take me out, like I said before, but it's also putting my faith in God that he will also take me through, that he will be with me through this. So my prayer then is should be the prayer of Jesus. God, save me. Yes. But nevertheless, not my will, but your <laughs> will be done. That's good. And I think one thing I want to touch on before we before you pray and we we give and, and close is I like Peter says, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful God. Mm, that's Why? Good. That's important. That word entrust and trust there. It literally means like hand over for protection mm-hmm. because nothing will jack up your soul oh, oui. like suffering. Yeah. Nothing will mess up, mess with your soul like suffering. And so he says, those of you who are suffering according to the will of God, not stuff you created, Mm -hmm. not because you meddling and murdering and stealing and talking bad about people and subliminally posting and all that stuff. And you dealing with the consequences of your actions, because that's the type of society we live in now. We don't like to deal with consequences. (laughs) So sometimes people want to punch you in the face for a reason. Somebody say amen to that. (laughs) But <clears throat> I like what he says. He says, therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator mm. while doing good. Because mm. one of the things we run the risk of in the midst of suffering is the deep scarring of the soul, mm. especially as it relates to the faithfulness of God in suffering. Yeah. He says, if this is, if your suffering is the will of God, make sure you entrust your soul to a faithful creator. Right. We he, he puts that faithful creator in there for a reason. Because the faithfulness of God in our hearts is challenged, in our souls is challenged in suffering. God is still faithful in the midst of our suffering. And so our responsibility is to hold on to that truth and entrust my soul to his faithfulness, understanding 
that he is the creator. I like how he puts that word there, mm -hmm. creator. Yeah. Like he is the originator. Yes. He is the creator. He is in control. Faithful it is all because of him. Like nothing is chaotic outside of his, like nothing is going, like, like nothing's growing wild outside of his, his sight. Okay. And he says that, and he says, do all of that while, while doing, doing good. good, while well doing. Mm -hmm. while well-doing grown up Paul says do not grow weary in well-doing like what is well-doing like serving the Lord with gladness mm -hmm. rejoicing in the Lord is doing well and he says entrust your souls to the faithful creator while well-doing or while doing good in other words don't allow suffering to sabotage service mm -hmm. don't allow suffering to sabotage service to continue to serve the lord with gladness yes. enter into his gates with yeah. thanksgiving and into his courts with praise be thankful unto him mm -hmm. and bless his name david said i will i will is an act of the soul Man. it is mm -hmm. a command of the soul I will bless the Lord at all time and his praises shall continue be in my in my mouth. David said, I command my soul so to bless the Lord. The Lord. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's our responsibility in suffering. And so we want to close here. We pray that you guys um, were blessed. Listen, before Lady J prays us out, um, I want to. Um, well, well, pray us out. Pray us out. There's two people watching. There's somebody who's watching us who doesn't know Jesus, somebody who does. Mm -hmm. I would need you to pray, um, briefly pray for for both those people. And then stay tuned because I'm going to ask you to do something else. So, Father, we come to you right now in this very moment, knowing above all that we need you. Father, I thank you for pricking the heart of that person that, doesn't know you that knows that they desperately need you as their savior as their lord that they may have been holding on to the things of this world and trying to find comfort and peace and solace and consolation in those things but have yet to find it father maybe they have realized that everything around them father it's is they're losing it father they're watching people lose things and lose people and they've come to the terms that god they need you father would you continue to move on their hearts and allow them to see you as savior as lord as master as a lover as father god as the one who is perfect peace who is the comforter of their souls draw them to you father like never before father i thank you even for what god that the pain is producing in their lives god i believe that the pain is pulling them to you father if that is the point if that is the perfect the purpose we praise your name for that god we pray for your sons and your daughters lord those who are experiencing calamity father we all know what it means to endure suffering we all know what it means to endure pain but god we thank you that your word offers an answer we thank you that your word does not leave us ignorant father we thank you lord that your word gives us an answer to life's problem the problem of pain and suffering god you allow us to know that we should not look at it look at it as something foreign as something strange as something weird happening to us god as just an interruption in our plans but lord that there is a point to our pain there is a purpose even in our suffering so father would you help us to lift our eyes to the hill knowing that our help comes from you and you alone would you help us to see you in all of your glory and all of your splendor and all of your beauty even when we are breaking even when the fire is causing us to bend even when we feel like we can't God we can't take anymore would you cause us to see you father in a whole new light would you cause us to understand father that the pain is not for nothing God that you will in fact work everything out for our good and your glory God that the enemy father cannot get any glory out of our lives father that we will not go through suffering father as one who is thinking it's strange as one who is not knowing what's happening but we know father that your word tells us that you will never leave us nor forsake us and so father we thank you for being there right with us in the fire we thank you for leading us father to a 
perspective that de- continues to declare that you are good, that you are perfect, God. We will make our boast in the Lord. We will rejoice and be yes. glad, even in our pain, Father. We thank you for giving us a better understanding. We thank you, Father, not for shielding us from the pain, God, but for walking us through it. We love you. We honor you. We give you glory that is due your name. Amen.